What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. Probably one of the most frustrating aspects of true crime is when crime goes unsolved. Horrible things happen to good people all the time, and we want justice for them. We want justice for ourselves. But sometimes there are no clues. There are no suspects. There isn't enough evidence to tell investigators what actually happened. Then again, sometimes there is a hint left behind in a crime scene. Sometimes the possibilities are evident, theories can be pieced together. But can they be proven? When it comes down to it, theories are great when searching for plausible scenarios, but they won't get you a conviction in court. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. friends and welcome to what happens in the woods how's everybody doing how you doing bryce i'm good you're good i'm good okay we are back this week on our regular schedule um hopefully everybody enjoyed the bonus episode thank you again tamara for taking that on it's a pretty big undertaking to research these things and now she knows what I do, my my pain that I go through. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe someday you'll know. Maybe someday you'll do this. Yeah. <laughs> no. Is that a no? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, I thought she did a really good job. So I appreciate it. It was nice to be on the other side of things, I guess. No, it so, wasn't. What do you mean? You were, you were over there. Ants in your pants. I was not. Giving up creative control. I was fine. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It's because I knew what to, like, I knew what was happening. You do shit and you don't ask me. No. No, you just do it and you expect that I'm going to go yes, along with it. You are. I'm just required to not have an opinion or a say because <laughs> you you want to do it. Yes. Right. That's not how I operate. That's how this works. That's never going to be how this works in anything, not just this podcast. Never. Okay. If you don't know that by now, I I don't know how to tell you. It's been over 20 years. Okay. (laughs) I love you. I love you too. All right. Do you have any updates for us? Um, My UK is still in the lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would like to, I guess, I mean, we've played the promos, but I'd just like to welcome everybody from the the true crime buzz podcast. If you're listening from them, welcome twisted and uncorked podcast. Welcome. And the wine, dine and story time podcast. We want to welcome everybody. If you guys have heard our promos from them and hopefully you stick around. Welcome. Welcome to the woods. Yes. Um, Yeah, we really have kind of expanded our engagement with other true crime podcasts. So they have been very, I don't know, we just kind of play off of each other and especially on social media. So it's it's very nice to have that interaction. And yeah, if you guys found us through them, thank you. And we hope you like us and definitely let them know that you found us. And, you know, engage with us on social media too. Yeah. All right. Any any other updates? That's like the most that you've talked. Yeah. In an update in a long time. Yeah. Any anything else? What else is on your on your chest? What else do you need to get out? Nothing. Oh, okay. That was short lived. And I'm quiet again. Okay. So this case 
actually is what I had planned on doing for our Halloween bonus episode. And it's going to be obvious why. But then we collabed with Crimes and Closets and I chucked it. And I wasn't sure if I would go back to it or if I would hold on to it for another like episode near Halloween, you know, this year. Yeah. I decided the time was right. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to delve into this one. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is the unsolved murder of Arpana Janaga. On November 3rd, 2008, 24-year-old Arpana was found brutally murdered in her apartment in Redmond, Washington. The crime scene was horrific. The condition of her body and the evidence that was found is, it's crazy. I don't say that lightly. We have discussed some very odd crime scenes on this podcast. This one is up there. So we're going to talk about Arpana before we get into the crime that took her life. She was born into a very bright and educated family. Arpana was the oldest of two children born to parents B.C. and Nirmala Jananga in the country of India. From all of my research, she was very intelligent. She enjoyed life, even at a young age. She loved art. She loved music. She loved her family. And as she got older, she started studying computer engineering and technology communication. She was one of 20 international students recognized in a competition in 2004, where she was able to make a communications jammer out of parts that were just, um, every contestant was given the same parts. Yeah. And that's what she made out of it. Uh, She was one of only... Like she was one of the only uh, out of those 20 contestants, she was the only one that was recognized in the Asian community. So this was an, on the international level. It was a company out of Arizona, uh-huh. but she was the only one out of the top 20 that was recognized in the Asian community. Okay. Like uh, she made top 20 because of what she did. Uh huh. And she was like, you think internationally there would have been another contestant in the top 20 odds are that would be Asian. And she was the only one. Oh yeah. Pretty, pretty big recognition that she, she earned that contest and the recognition helped to get her into school in the U S. So her dream was to, you know, pursue a career in computer engineering. Yeah. She was able to uh, move to the U.S. She graduated with her master's in electrical engineering and computer engineering from Rutgers University. Okay. That was in 2007. Um, companies were taking notice of her talents and she landed a job not long after she graduated with a company called EMC, which now is part of the computer company Dell. So by the beginning of 2008, Arpana moved to the West Coast. She began a career as a quality assurance engineer. She quickly promoted to lead programmer. And when they talk, you know, about her at that job, she was described as a valuable employee and a rising star by her supervisor. They really felt her loss. Like she was a very valued employee. She was very smart and she was very engaging, uh, like the type of person that she was. While here in the U.S., Arpana kept in close contact with her family. I mean, you can imagine time difference is an issue. Yeah. Um, she's a young woman on her own, essentially. Her father uh, was also a, um, he was a professor. So he also worked in the technology field. And her sister, actually, because of what Arpana was able to do in that competition that she took part in, she actually started to pursue a career in engineering, like computer engineering as well. And her, was her father a professor back in India? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. And she really just had that dream of succeeding. She wanted to follow in her father's footsteps. She wanted to be in a professor as well eventually. Yeah. Um, But she definitely felt, you know, loved and supported by her family. 
So the family members would call or video chat as much as would allow with the time difference. They were incredibly proud of her. And of course, they missed her. She missed them as well. But she found a community here in Washington that, you know, helped her feel more at home. She really got involved. Many times while reading reports and articles, she's described as being infectious to be around. She just was so warm and giving and inviting. She made people feel immediately at ease. She was um, volunteering time at an animal shelter. Yeah. And she was also volunteering for the local fire department. Keep in mind, she'd been in the country for a while. She had gone to school, you know, gotten her master's. She had been here since she was 20 about. But she'd only been in Washington six months before she died. And she was able to get this job. She was volunteering in those two places. Yeah. And, you know, just living life really to its fullest. Yeah, I mean, I I know people, you know, Americans don't even do that. Yeah, no. Volunteer at an animal shelter and a fire department. Right. And have a job. Right. I You know, full-time demanding job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, She also, when she moved here, she decided that her mode of transportation was going to be a motorcycle. So she bought a Suzuki. She had never ridden one. She didn't know much about them. Yeah. But she thought, why why the hell not? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it. So she took classes. She bought a Suzuki. She ended up joining a club called the Pacific Northwest Riders. And she would go on rides with them. Yeah. And she quickly became close with them as well. Yeah. So well, you, especially with her infectious personality. Yeah, no, she definitely was well liked by, you know, people when just right from meeting her just the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So you can imagine, I mean, after her death, she was missed greatly and it was really felt in the community, in her community for sure. So Arpana was last seen on the night of October 31st when she joined with her neighbors for a uh, Halloween party in her apartment building. Okay. So that's why I was going to do it for the Halloween episode. It would have been, it, I mean, it would have been a no brainer, but yeah, that's all right. So the entire building would get together and throw kind of like a block party, basically where people would dress up, go to around a, you know, the different apartments that were open, just hang out and have a good time. She was very excited for this. She was talking about it with coworkers and her family in India about how much she was looking forward to the evening, you know, days leading up to this. She had bought a costume. She had decorations for her apartment and um, she was the first apartment where people started their night at. Yeah. So from all the accounts up until she left to go back to her apartment when the party was over, everything was well. Like people were having fun. It was a good time. There's one account where she did get into like a verbal um, altercation with somebody and they have a feeling like something was said to her that was uh, like race related. Yeah. And it, you know, kind of irritated her, but she went about her night and didn't let it affect her. And then nothing else happened. There weren't any other like memorable or weird events that happened. So she leaves the first floor floor apartment where the party kind of ended. It's night, walks up to her third floor apartment. And that is the last that anyone has any knowledge of her. Do they know what time that was? That was about 3 a.m. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, technically in the morning of November 1st. Yeah. So her family had been waiting to hear from her about how the evening had gone. They, you know, she had talked about it so much and um, was so excited about it that they expected her to call them pretty, pretty soon after the party. They didn't hear from her. All the calls and messages from her parents and her sister were unanswered. It was absolutely unlike her. They weren't sure what to do, so they contacted a former student of her father's who also lived in the area, in the Seattle area, to, you know, just go and check on her. Just, can you see if everything's okay? Maybe she's not feeling good. Something's up. When she didn't show up for work on Monday the 3rd, her boss also became concerned. That was absolutely not like her. 
and she had not called in and said she was sick, nothing, you know, no knowledge. So he tried to reach her several times. Those went unanswered as well, went right to voicemail. It was absolutely out of the ordinary for her. Yeah. So it's about 9 a.m. on the morning of the 3rd when the family friend, whose name is Jay, showed up at uh, the apartment building. While on his way up to her apartment on the third floor, he came across one of her neighbors. is a guy na- by the name of Cameron Johnson. He did it. Calm down. <laughs> so Johnson happens to live in one of the uh, apartments that like shares a wall with Arpana's. Uh-huh. So the two get to her door and right away they notice that something's off. The door has obvious signs of forced entry. They both enter to find her apartment in complete disarray. It's very clear that there was a struggle. Shit is, it, it doesn't look good. They also notice a unexplainable heavy smell of cleaning products as well as like some unknown chemical. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, as they're making their way through the apartment and, you know, calling out to her, they get down the hallway, they get to her room and they find her body on the floor. She's by the by her bed face down. She's nude and she's in a state of decomposition already. Uh, How long was this? Um, So she was found on the third, um, but her last known sighting was that 3 a.m. on the third. The first, basically, okay. the morning of the first. So Jay immediately calls nine one one. The men are told to leave the apartment, but to stay on scene until pol- police arrive. Yeah. During this time, Jay makes a call to Arpana's family in India to let them know, you know, what's happened. And you can imagine they're they're devastated. Yeah. They don't know what to do. There's no answers, of course, because this is. A, needs to be investigated so it's it's just a horrible thing to get news that way oh yeah be so far away and not be able to be there yeah not directly there get answers right and you're you know you're gonna have to wait for phone calls you're gonna have to wait for any information yeah and And half a world away yeah i i can't imagine i i just the feelings of dealing with that and you know, trying to grieve, trying to get answers, trying to, to just know. Yeah. So the news hits the media pretty quickly that there was a murder and they're not going to release the name. Keep in mind, this is one of only two homicides in the city of Redmond that entire year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Redmond is considered, was at that time, at least very safe. Yeah. Very safe community. Um, d- things like this just didn't happen. That other crime that had taken place was actually a murder suicide. Okay. And and it was very looked at. Like the a lot of the investigators, that was like their first crime of that type. So it was it was really looked at. It was all over the media. This one comes along and again, it's everywhere because in this community, this shit just doesn't happen. Yeah. So it's actually a liaison at the company that she works for EMC that lets her name out when the company presents a statement. And I thought that was very odd because nobody asked you. Yeah. (laughs) Nobody asked you to come forward with her name. Oh, or even... Yeah, what do you have to do with this? What do you have to do with it? We're going to release a statement. Right. right. I I don't know if they were trying to jump the gun and and just kind of get ahead of any speculation. I, I don't even they, know. What, I don't know why they would do that. It wasn't like they were being looked at. No. Nobody there was I, Nobody's looking at anything yet. They just found her. Yeah. Yeah. That just seems kind of It seems very odd. Yeah. Police show up pretty quickly, but it takes like four or five hours for CSI and the medical examiners to come. It's a long time. Yeah. I get it, but it's it's a long time for nothing to be happening, essentially. Well, you're um, talking about something that happened twice that year. Right. And, and I'm not sure 
They're just trying to put their jacket on. How does this go again? <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, King County um, medical examiners, uh, you know, were sent from like the Seattle, Seattle. area, maybe. Yeah, and maybe, maybe that's why it took so long. Well, um, that wasn't mentioned in, in any of the research. That's what I'm assuming because that's her autopsy is performed at the King County. Oh, uh, usually it's, yeah, it's at the center. Yeah. So I, I just kind of assumed that they had to maybe travel as well as just gather what they needed or, yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause like when we would have something happen in, um, Fairfield or Sassoon in California. Yeah. Uh, the corner's right there at downtown Fairfield. Cause right. it's the seat of Solano, but, oh, well, you know, that, but like if it happened in Davis, you right. it'd be forever because it's Yolo County and the, the seat is Yuba. Right. So it'd take like two hours for the coroner to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, that is what I assumed. It's just kind of, it, it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, her, her family wants some answers and that, that right there is going to just impede any Although, of that. But this is just the CSI team. It's just the the ME and the CSI. The police are there. Uh, like, you know, whoever is the first responder to, to that yeah, came, correct. you know, I'm sure and I'm sure any first responders came because they were they found the body, but the, as far as I know they didn't touch it. So she could they very well have still been alive to them. Yeah. They didn't know the difference, you know, who who found her. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and heaven forbid we had like a fatality in in Richmond, because who knows how many people like when we would have one. Because yeah. like, there was one time I had to wait four hours because there was two other homicides. Yeah, that's true. They're like, "Yep, you're yeah, in line." If they're, if they're coming from another area that has a a um, higher rate of crimes like that, yeah, it, it would, I, it would I take think, a while. I don't know. I don't remember how far Redmond is from. Seattle, but if it's in King County, that's still, you know, the medical examiner to get out there, that's still a ways. Sorry. It's not too terribly far away from Seattle. It because EMC is in Bellevue, so she worked relatively close to that. Yeah. Where she lived. Well, I mean it wasn't it wasn't close necessarily, but I I know it's not, you know, like from where we are to Seattle, it's not that far. Yeah. Yeah. So they're there while they're waiting for the, you know, the medical examiner and everybody else to show up. They start questioning neighbors and they start working on a timeline. And when they finally get there to start, you know, looking over the crime scene, it's it's incredible what they find it. I don't know. I It makes you question what people are thinking for sure. Yeah. So first off, they know this was a forced entry. Because of the state that the door's in. The door jam's broken. Parts of the deadbolt are on the ground. Okay. They can tell that Arpana fought back. Um, she actually was practicing Taekwondo. So she did know some things that I'm yeah. sure she tried to use to, to defend herself. When did she learn this? In between her volunteering and mm -hmm. her job? Jeez. Yeah. I feel lazy. <laughs> And she's only 24 years old. I feel lazy. Yeah. It's unsure if the intent was robbery as well as assault because of the mess that's all over the place. Mm -hmm. Investigators don't rule it out, but they don't know right away if anything's missing. Yeah. So it's it's just a thought. It is evident from the state of the apartment that somebody tried very hard to cover up any traces of evidence that they had left. Yeah. Very hard to cover this up. So among all of the things, a few stand out more. So they find a blanket that they later find out that had been taken off of her bed. Someone had tried to burn it in the front room, along with a cape that was part of her Halloween costume. Both of those have blood on them. While the small fire scorched the carpet, nothing actually caught fire. Okay. Yeah. The unknown chemical smell turns out to be motor oil that had been doused all over the apartment in random places. Okay. I guess to contaminate the scene. 
I think that was just kind of a, a byproduct of it. I honestly think because they did try to start the fire, I feel, and and it's pretty accepted that this is the the thought process, they were trying to set the, the apartment on fire. With motor oil. Right. Because this blanket had motor oil on it, and they tried to start the fire there. There were other places where motor oil was found specifically on her body and around her body as well in the other room. I'm not trying to give out advice to future, you know. Right. Motor oil isn't that flammable. No, it's combustible. And then um, it has a higher flash point. So yes. I read that. I read up on it because I was like, I, you know, geez, never thought about it. Gasoline's flammable, but motor oil is not flammable it's combustible yeah so you can get it to light on fire but it is not going to spread a fire yeah right that's it's it's different it has to be exposed to the type of heat that you're not going to get yeah. from a, a lighter or yeah, that's, yeah yeah it's not so if that was what they were trying to do like i said it scorched the carpet but yeah. nothing else, like fire did not spread. You, sir, or madam, are a genius. Right. It also does, though, if you, you know, let's just say that they knew that it wouldn't start fire. Yeah. It does contaminate things. No, I know. And that's, pr- I was badly. hoping that's, that's what it was. But then you said they tried to light it on fire. And I'm just like, Ugh. they, the way that it was spread around the apartment leads me to believe that. They thought they could. They use thought this as maybe a they could use it as a propellant. Yeah, and and I, yeah, for somebody who doesn't know anything about cars, really, I think I would have caught on that it wasn't catching fire, and oh, this isn't going to burn down the building. They probably weren't in class with Arpana, you know. They right. weren't geniuses like her. No, she. I feel that that's definitely something she would have known. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think I would have gotten there after a minute because I, I do think that I know that, but it's not a thought that I, you know, it's not something that occurs to me every day. Like I, I don't touch motor oil ever. So How many crimes are you planning over there? None. I'm huh? not planning any, mm-hmm. but that's the thing. I think at some point I would have recognized that, but okay. I, I'm just saying, yeah, I I do feel that it's possible that they were looking at it as, as a two-parter. Like, yeah, this is going to destroy evidence, but it's also going to catch fire. I don't know. You would hope? I, maybe. So, okay, there's the motor oil that's all over the apartment. When they go to the bedroom, the sheets are missing. They find that the comforter is off of her bed sitting in the bathtub, which has been filled with water and bleach. Okay. That also had traces of blood on it. But now that is, it's stained with blood. The the blood is unusable because it's been contaminated with bleach. There's also bleach crystal residue found on her mattress cover. There are signs that bleach was poured on other furniture pieces in the front room, as well as drops of it, you know, going through the carpet down the hallway. So they think that whoever started pouring this bleach started in the front room. Just have motor oil and bleach. No, this is stuff that was in her apartment. Okay. So. I just thought it was a chemical fairy. (laughs) Blessing the whole apartment. No. What the hell, man? So they think the bleach pour, like the pores were in, started in the front room. Yeah. And then they can see a trail going down to the bedroom in the hallway. And then it's poured over her and in other places. And of course in the bathtub. Okay. There's also, um, like I said, it's, there's motor oil on her yeah there's blood on her from her injuries and there's also a blue stain on her hands they later find out that that is from a toilet bowl cleaner <laughs> okay. so just a, a second form of bleach. her death it's just uh, what? no and all of I'm the so mixture of these chemicals these chemicals right there had been a fab- piece of fabric shoved into her mouth as a gag. And of course, then they put duct tape over it to keep it in place. There were signs that she had been strangled and suffocated. There were also signs that she was sexually assaulted. Further investigation leads them to more weird evidence in the building's dumpster out back. 
it's a shared, you know, dumpster for the apartment building. Yeah. There they find a plastic bag that contains a bottle of castor oil. No, what's it called? Castrol? Castrol. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Motorcycle oil that is all over the apartment. So the contents of that bottle is what's in the apartment. This is the empty bottle. Okay. So it's in a plastic bag. There's more pieces of her costume that also have um, blood and oil and bleach on them. And a, a bathrobe that has blood on it and her sheets missing from her bed. There's evidence of blood on pretty much on all of that. Missing from the scene are her ID, her BlackBerry, which for those who don't know is a, a phone <laughs> type of phone. A, yeah, the first smartphone. Right. And uh, a camera. So a Digital camera? They didn't say. Oh, okay. Yeah, they didn't say. I'm going to assume so. That was 2009 was pretty big or 2008 was pretty big, like around that time yeah. for digital cameras. So I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Given that she kind of works in the tech world, I'm kind of picturing that she has whatever the latest is. Maybe. Yeah. Her body is then taken to King County medical examiner's office for an autopsy. The Emmy can confirm she was killed the morning of November 1st, sometime between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m., but that's as specific as they can get. The cause of death is listed as asphyxiation due to strangulation. And there is a ligature that they find. They think it's a boot lace. Yeah. She also suffered multiple other injuries before being killed. So there were blunt force um, blows to her head. They caused trauma and uh, she had broken teeth from it. Unfortunately, the autopsy confirms that Arpana was violently gagged and raped by her assailant. The crime lab goes through several items of evidence looking for DNA, fingerprints, fluids, anything at all to try and find out, you know, any connections of who did this. And after months, they do find something useful. I'm going to get to that in a moment, though. After the autopsy is completed, the community gathers to celebrate Arpana's life. Her parents requested that her body be sent home to them. Yeah. That request is granted after, of course, the autopsy. They get her back home in India for a proper burial that aligned with her culture and her beliefs. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm glad that they were able to to do that. I'm, I'm sure that was an undertaking to try to do that for her. The um, motorcycle club that she was part of also organized like a memorial ride as a group in her honor. Uh And you can actually still find their chat threads, like their conversation chat on their website about her. And some mention like they followed this as it played out with when evidence was found, who eventually is arrested. And I'll get to that. That's not a spoiler, but you know how this plays out. They follow that, and a lot of people still comment on that. It's closed now, but up until I think the last post that I read were like 2019, mm-hmm. there people were still going on there and, and talking about it. So just really goes to show you she'd only been in Washington six months, and she had already touched over you know hundreds of people. Oh, just just with her being her. That's awesome. Yeah. I just got, you know, reading there, um, especially on that website on the Pacific Northwest writers, it really gave me a feel for just like how special she was. Everybody had something really unique to say about her, yeah. like a, a story to share. And it really, yeah, it just really made me think of like this woman was, was special. So in the following months, investigators keep questioning anyone they can. They find people at the party on the night of the murder. They question the neighbors, her co-workers, even her family overseas. They're trying to put like a timeline of events together, you know, leading up to her death. But nothing out of the ordinary stands out prior to the night of the Halloween party. They can't really find it. She doesn't deviate her schedule. There's nothing weird that they find on any records. There's no, you know, her computer doesn't have any answers. They're not finding anything that stands out. Yeah. 
and any connection to why this might have happened to her. Eventually, they learned that Arpana left the first floor of the building to go back up to her apartment, like I said, 3 a.m. She was presumably alone when she left. A witness who was returning home around the same time, who hadn't been at the Halloween party, claims to have seen a male standing in Arpana's doorway. Later, it was confirmed that it's linked to one of the people that I'll talk about. But it's not a usable piece of evidence. And I'll get to that. It was sometimes after that that the neighbors heard soft moaning sounds coming from her apartment. No one reports hearing a break-in, even though the door was obviously broken. Nobody heard it. But they heard soft moans. I, I don't know how you would hear that and not a large crash. Yeah, kicking bang. in the door. Right. Wood breaking. I don't know. It didn't occur to anyone that those moaning sounds were anything other than consensual sex. And when witnesses heard the shower turn on and run for about an hour, again, nobody thought much of it. Yeah. Later on, around 8 a.m., a neighbor reportedly heard what they described as a growl coming from the apartment. Again, I don't know how you hear a growl and not a door breaking. Yeah. But okay. Alcohol was in play, I'm sure, at this party. Yeah. After that, no one really recalls anything other than, you know, just going about their day at that point. No other noises coming from her apartment. After what seemed like forever, the forensic evidence comes back. It's months. Authorities zero in on two different DNA profiles that point to two likely suspects. One DNA sample was taken from the motorcycle oil bottle, and another sample was found on the bathrobe, both of which were in the trash outside. Okay. There was also DNA from a swab taken on Arpana's neck, and also from the tape used for the gag across her mouth. So the bathrobe, the tape, and the swab on her neck belong to one man. The motor oil bottle DNA belongs to another. Oh. Right. So you find two pieces of evidence that have two different DNAs on it together in a bag. Kind of leads you to believe that maybe somebody was working with somebody else. Yeah, it may have been more than one attacker. Right. Right. So when we get back from the break, I'll tell you who this DNA belonged to and how only one of these men is arrested and tried, but ultimately found not guilty of the crime. It's taken months for investigators to get any leads in connection to Arpana Janaga's murder. After conducting interviews, they wait for the Washington State Crime Lab to process multiple items, and eventually DNA evidence is traced back to two men. Both men were at the Halloween party that night and both had been questioned multiple times in prior months about their possible connection to the crime. So the first is her neighbor, Cameron Johnson. Yeah, he did it. Okay. Don't say that. Don't, don't get ahead. So the very, he was the very same one who met up with Jay, the family friend before they both entered Arpana's apartment and found her body. Cameron reportedly told investigators that he had a thing for Arapana, but that as she became more involved in the community with her motorcycle, they hadn't been as close. But he was definitely very attracted to her, and he was quoted as saying that he wanted to try to hook up with her at this party. He claims the night of the party he went to bed around midnight, but he was awakened around 3 a.m. to the moaning sounds coming from her apartment. Apparently his wall where his couch was was a shared wall with her apartment. Yeah. Again, he heard the moanings, but not he the door. He heard the kicked. moanings, but not the door. Because he's the one that kicked it in. I don't know. So his phone records actually show that he made calls to Arpana around 2.50 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. But he claims he has no knowledge of doing that. Yeah, right. So when he was being investigated, uh, or when he was being questioned by the investigators, He uh, told him that he recently had stopped taking medication for a mental illness. He didn't clarify what type of mental illness. Uh And when they presented a lot of the, you know, I don't want to say evidence, but a lot of the facts 
that they had found based off of them searching his phone records and other things. Mm -hmm. He claimed to not have knowledge of it. Right. Yeah. So another very suspicious thing, why investigators kind of zero in on him at first was because he had attempted to drive into Canada the day after Arpana's murder. He claimed he was just taking a drive. He Mm -hmm. wanted to go Mm -hmm. explore. Right. And had no clear intention when he got in the car that he was, you know, going to flee the country. Right. At the border, uh, Canadian Border Patrol actually pulled him over when he tried to just go through and not stop and declare himself. Uh, He didn't have a passport, so he didn't get very far. And they searched his car and turned him around and said, you need to go home. Police also found record of a search on his computer that day of local pawn shops, mm-hmm. which he also had no answer for when questioned. Was there a search about how to dispose of a body? No. Right. So until the DNA evidence came back, he was just a person who knew Arpana and who had an inconsistent story. And he, after that, was quickly marked as a person of interest. P.O.I. Yes. The next person of interest is a man by the name of Emmanuel Fair, a.k.a. Anthony P. Parker. I I don't know why he goes to Emmanuel Fair after. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Anthony P. Parker is his uh, legal name from what I can see. Okay. His was the DNA that was found on Arpana's body, the bathrobe and the duct tape. Oh. Yeah. Fair was a guest of one of the apartment building residents, so he didn't actually live there. He was there for the party. He was staying with somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, Up until that point, he was technically homeless. Um, He and Johnson had confirmed to authorities that they met each other that night, just, you know, randomly. And they were hanging out for a little bit in the parking lot, talking about a music editing software program. And they were listening to music on it. Right. So when they were done in the parking lot, in the parking lot, did he have a laptop or something on somebody? Yeah. On somebody's laptop. I think okay. it was Johnson's laptop, All right. Cameron Johnson's laptop. So they claimed they were, they parted ways and they went back to the party. They didn't see each other again. There was no other known connection between the two men. Okay. Emmanuel also has a bit of a rap sheet. Um, so he had, previously been convicted and served time for the rape of a minor. Mm. So this is a real asshole. Yeah. Due to a plea deal, he barely served two years of his conviction and he was released, but repeatedly failed to report as a sex offender. What kills me is he was released as a level one, Mm -hmm. which is not, they're not worried about you. They're not worried about you at all. You're not a violent repeat offender. He held this 15 year old girl at gun or yeah, gunpoint and raped her. How are you a level one offender? (laughs) Yeah. And she claims that it happened more than once. He was only arrested after the last offense, but she claims that it happened multiple times over the period of a year. How are you a level one? Those other claims could not be substantiated. They could not. And he did, um, in exchange for, you know, pleading guilty to a lesser charge. Yeah. This is what you get. So, like I said, he repeatedly failed to report as a sex offender wherever he was living. And then at some point he reports himself as homeless. And in, and he's supposed to be checking in with King County Sheriff Weekly. Yeah. He doesn't. So in between the time after the murder and 2009, he actually ends up going to jail and serving four years in jail because he doesn't report that he's a sex offender. Oh, so they finally caught up with him. Right. After four years. After after a little being while. Being released. Yeah. And in society. Right. Boy, um, those guys were... About three years, but he serves four years, yeah. No, I meant... Oh. It takes him about three years to get him oh, on these violations. Yeah. yeah. So investigators had spoke to him on November 21st of 2008 after finding him in a photo taken by somebody that night at the party. So they had been trying to contact all of the people in the building who were at the party, but for some reason he wasn't, it wasn't declared 
that he was there. Yeah. They found him in a photo and they're like, Hey, who's this guy? Mm-hmm. And, and that's how it came about that they questioned him. Oh, okay. Otherwise they might not have ever questioned him. They wouldn't have known yeah. that he was there. Fear tells authorities he met Arpana for the first time that night in her apartment where the party started claiming she showed him some photos off of her computer. But that was the extent of it, according to him. However, his story is also full of a bunch of holes. The time he says he was in the friend's apartment, his phone logs show texts and calls to that friend. So he's calling the person who he, apartment he's supposed to be in at the time. Okay. It makes no sense. Nope. He also called about a dozen women, different women, between the times of 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. that morning. One person would later go on to testify that when she checked her voicemail, it was just sounds of somebody moving along, like shuffling sounds. He never says anything. Huh. So it might have been like a butt dial or a pocket dial. But he claims during that time that he was in his friend's apartment and he was asleep. Right. Right. You're not, obviously. It also came out uh, at some point that the music editing software, once they're able to look through Cameron Johnson's laptop, yeah. it was being used on that computer at 2.30 a.m., which is much longer than either one of the men claimed. They said they both went to bed. Uh, Johnson said at midnight. midnight yeah. And uh, Fair says it at 1 a.m. He was back in the apartment and going to bed. This says 2.30 that the software was open. So who was using it? It doesn't just pop on by itself. Sure it does. No. So there's that. So the charges, remember I mentioned only one man was charged in this case. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That is not, they don't bring charges to Cameron Johnson. Okay. So Emmanuel Fair was charged on... Uh, October 29th, 2010, nearly two years exactly after the murder. He was charged with first degree murder. However, his trial didn't start until 2017. What? Yeah. So there was some legal, there was a legal battle going on because the company that had ana- um, analyzed his DNA yeah. is called uh, True Allel. And it's a long story. Basically, they go on what's called um, probabilistic genotyping. Okay. So the crime lab, the, the, you know, King County crime lab already confirmed that that DNA matched him. Yeah. They already confirmed that Cameron Johnson's DNA matched him. Yeah. They had these two people, but this uh, true allel takes it a little bit further and does probability of how likely it is based on what they find of who would be the killer. So nowadays this is technology that's being used. Like it's, it's commonly being looked at Yeah. like genotyping and probability of yeah. likely likeliness of, you know, based on where the, the DNA is found and, and things like that. They're okay. looking at this. Okay. In 2009, up until this case, like this lawsuit was dismissed. Yeah. People weren't looking, they weren't using it. They didn't know it. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't trust it. No. Yeah. It seems like uh, this is a probability that he did it. It's not a probability that he did it. It's the probability of the, the likelihood of his DNA. It can zone in on that probability of that DNA matching him even more. Okay. So as we're, and I'm probably not explaining it right, but when I was looking at what the crime lab brought, like their information when they ran the DNA, he was a thousand times more likely, Emmanuel Fair, to be the person whose DNA this was out of all, because he is an African-American man out of all African American men, he was a thousand times more likely to match this DNA. When it's run through Truelel, it's five point nine million times more likely 
that he is the person who matches this DNA. Okay. So they can, you know, with the genotyping, they can zero in on this so much more than the crime lab could. Okay. That's probably because they specialize in it. Right. So the problem was the defense was saying that, so True LL won't release their source code yeah. for their program. It's not. it's it's secret it's information. Proprietary it's proprietary information. Yeah. So the defense put in this, you know, basically a, a they wanted it to be reviewed. Yeah. They want this source code released. And they were saying that it, you know, without the source code, the results can't be confirmed. But they have a witness, an expert, apparently, who just the year before comes out and says that without the source code, he could validate with his own data. So their own witness, the defense has, saying that this is not, you know, shouldn't be allowed in this lawsuit or in this this criminal trial, Uh is confirming that he could come to these same results if he uses his own data. Okay. Right. Why it took the state six years to throw this out and say the DNA is valid, I don't know. But because of that, it took them seven years to put actually start the trial for this guy. And in the end, the source code is not released. Trollel does not need to, to do it. They've been sued multiple times in multiple states. Yeah. And they still have not had to release their source code. Because it doesn't matter. Yeah. So it, it was a nice little hiccup for him. He sat in jail that whole time. He oh. was not released on bail. He had to sit and wait. In the end, though, um, when his uh, first trial does start, they screw themselves. So they don't charge Cameron, but they name him as an un, basically a uncharged accomplice. So they're saying that Emmanuel did it, but he had help. Yeah. But we're not charging the accomplice. So it confuses the Fair jury. Was, oh. They're saying he did it. They're saying Fair did this. Emmanuel Fair was the killer. Yeah. Based off of where his DNA was found. Okay. It was found on key, um, like key, you know, it's on her body. It's on her bathrobe that she probably was wearing, and it's on the duct tape that was all across her mouth. Those are key um, pieces of evidence yes. where a killer would have touched her or had contact with her. The motor oil bottle was not. It didn't physically have anything to do with her death. Yeah. So he was released? He was never charged. He was never arrested. Cameron Johnson was not. Yeah. Right. But like I said, during the trial, they named him as an uncharged accomplice. It confused the jury. It They couldn't agree. And they also, I don't know how the prosecutors thought that they were going to get a, a jury to convict him. You cannot say then that this man has done this without a reasonable doubt. And that's the whole for first degree murder, it has to be without reasonable doubt. Yeah. You have to say, I can convict him. There is no reasonable doubt that he didn't do this. Yeah. I you can say a hundred percent that this is this death is the fault of this person. You can't say that when you're talking about an uncharged accomplice whose charges are never going to be brought to them. They've never been arrested. The police are not even actively seeking to arrest them. Huh. So it ended up in a hung jury, essentially. So they restart. Uh, they're going to retrial in September of 2017. Ends up being delayed because of an appeal that his defense again puts in. Um, this time it's for Cameron Johnson being named as that uncharged accomplice. Yeah. However, the state allows it. So when they go to the next trial, this was uh, the next year, so 2018, they again use the same DNA. 
there's no issue with true, true allele anymore. Okay. Okay. They use the same DNA. They still name Cameron Johnson as an uh, uncharged accomplice. They even have Cameron Johnson take the stand, but he can only answer limited questions because they don't want him to self-incriminate. Okay. But they still cannot prove without reasonable doubt, beyond reasonable doubt, that uh, Emmanuel Fair is the only person that committed this crime. So he is found not guilty and he is acquitted of all charges. Oh. So, like I said, I want to remind everybody, Cameron was never charged for anything. I don't want to put it out there that, you know, we're, we're assuming things. To me, though, the state could have charged him. Yeah. They could have arrested him. They did have probable cause. I do think that they could have solidified their case yeah. with Emmanuel if they had just taken the time to put the pieces together. The stories didn't line up. The timeline didn't line up of what they told investigators. They both had inconsistencies with their stories. I think the problem is that nobody could actually prove what exactly took place in that apartment and who did what. Yeah. You can to a certain point, but it's it's hard to say. Yeah. She, you know, one of those guys could have been in there and it could have been consensual. And then, you know, somebody else came in and it wasn't. Yeah. She also had had that party and had a lot of people in there and DNA was everywhere. So Cameron Johnson could have been in that apartment, touched that bottle of motor, motor oil, left and not been in there again. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know? Maybe he helped her change oil. I don't know. Something. It, it, he... The problem, I think the problem is the, the prosecution should not have focused on that if they could not pursue that line. Yeah. I don't know why you would name his, him as an uncharged accomplice. You can't prove it. Focus on what you can prove. You have this guy's DNA on the tape that was placed over her mouth with the gag. Yeah. He had no business with that. You can't mean to tell me that he was touching her neck and uh, her bathrobe and the duct tape while he was just at the party that he, you know, had never met her before. Yeah. And he's touching those things. Maybe. So, come on now. <laughs> I, it just, it's very unfortunate to me because I, I do think that they were on the right train. They were, they were right there. Yeah. And there's a possibility that one of these guys did it. Or both of them did it. But they they didn't have all of their shit lined up right to no. be able to prove it and to be able to pursue it. And it's just, it's very unfortunate because, you know, to this day, her death remains unsolved. That's sad. I hate that. I hate it too. So, yeah, it's it's just a very unfortunate thing. I just don't feel that the, the prosecutors did their best to to bring the best they didn't do their due case diligence. out yeah it's a very unfortunate story yeah. and it's it hopefully you know with dna I, I i just i don't even know if it's being looked at as of right now it's just a cold case so i don't know if at some point they'll bring it back out and they'll reinvestigate but you know the one's been tried and found not guilty he can't be tried for the same crime again no so that's that's it you you're done but, you know, if there is somebody else involved and they can eventually prove that, who knows how long that would take? Who knows if that will ever happen? But Hopefully soon. I mean, hopefully. But like I said, I, I don't think this is actively being looked at. Um, it yeah. is it is a cold case. So it's very it's just really unfortunate. You know, she was very special young woman. And she definitely deserved and she got. She's actually doing good in this world. And then she was snuffed out yeah. just after six months. Yeah. Just six months of being in this state. She. That's horrible. Yeah. Degree from Rutgers. Volunteer fire department. Volunteer 
animal shelter. Yeah. And taekwondo. Yeah, and taekwondo whenever she yeah, and she was like when she was in college, she was in a band. Like there was just all sorts of shit about her. There was yeah. just she wanted to live life. She wanted to have fun. She wanted to learn. She wanted to well, Of course she did. She left yeah. India to come to the United States where she had no family. Yeah. But get the, you know, a good education. And she had already been going to school over there too. Oh yeah. I mean, she had already she'd already been going to a college and India, yeah. pursuing higher education there and then yeah, just from from her recognition in that competition she she changed her life, you know? Yeah. But it just was it's very unfortunate. So um, these these are the things that I don't know. I don't have any new information and it, it's kind of, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. There have been a couple other podcasts that have done this, you know, case and reported uh-huh. on it, but it's just kind of that hope that at some point somebody hears something or comes forward or there's new information that we can give out. Yeah. Cameron. Yeah. I don't, What? I don't know. I don't know. Well, how do you hear the soft moans, but not the door kicking in? Well, how you were the one kicking it? the door in. How does anybody hear it? And no one saw anything. And and because the guy got away because he just lives next door. I mean, maybe. That's my theory. I maybe I don't know. I mean, the police really were interested in him, but they never charged him. Yeah, but I'm not a professional. So. And I don't know why you're going to run off to Canada the next day just for shits and giggles. <laughs> yeah. That's what we have to stop at the understand. border? What are these yeah. guys waving guns at me for? We yeah. have to stop. Hey, you, you you can't pass through here. No, <laughs> sorry, eh? Yeah, it's it's very sad. Well, hopefully, we get an update by the end of the season. I mean, hopefully. Are you putting that out there? Yes. Is that is that your premonition? Manifesting. Manifesting. All right, we're manifesting an answer for our pana. We want this solved. Yeah. 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 All right, guys, thank you, as always, for joining us. We hope that um, you interact with us on social media. Leave us a comment and like us on any of the platforms where you listen. And rate us and review us. Till next time, stay out of the damn woods. Stay out of the woods. It's no good. Bye, guys. Bye.